see me, you Stevie. Wondering how I reach more evolutions than Eevee and make it look easy. What is up, Earth's mightiest subscribers? It's Ernie, the Blur Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, so today's video, we are going to be talking about all new Venom number one. This is the first issue of a new Venom saga that is also still written by the previous Venom series writer, Al Ewing. And this is in the wake of all things Venom War, which has come and gone. Actually did a full live stream talking all about Venom War. For the most part in its entirety, you can go check it out up here if you have a mind to do so. Probably put some more clarity in some things that we're going to talk about here. But this is all new Venom series, as I stated earlier. And this is, for all intents and purposes, I would say probably a good jumping on point for Venom. If you're one of those people who has not read Venom since like the old lethal protector days, or if you're someone who hasn't read Venom since since like Flash Thompson was Agent Venom, or even if you were somebody who maybe hasn't read, you know, since the Donny Cates run, or never read any of the previous Venom stuff after that, which was uh, basically when Ram V and Al Ewing were both writing the series, I would say you honestly don't really need to know anything from it. There will be definitely some things that you should know that would help you out, but I can kind of help you out with that. Basically, the long and short of it is Eddie Brock is no longer Venom. As a matter of fact, he is now Carnage. And if you're wondering why he is Carnage now, it is because during the events of Venom War, Venom was separated from the Venom symbiote and then later reunited with it. But shortly after that, he was infected by Carnage's weapon, All Red, which is basically Carnage's equivalent to All Black, the Necro Sword, which was wielded by Null. It was used in an effort to corrupt Eddie and ultimately take his influence as the new King in Black to effectively turn all symbiotes across the entire city of New York which was basically all of where Venom War took place, turn each of those people that were infected by the zombiotes, yeah, I know, just go with it, turn them into zombiote carnages, I guess is the best way to put it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Meridius, a future version of Eddie Brock, killed Eddie Brock, or at least mortally wounded him, but Eddie obviously is still alive, and he went on to take the Carnage symbiote. And all in the midst of that, Dylan Brock, who is the son of Eddie Brock, but actually more specifically, the half-human, half-symbiote son of the Venom symbiote itself, which that's a long story. I'm sure I'll remember to put a video link in here somewhere to go back to a video where I talked about that before, because it's just a whole lot to take in. But Dylan Brock was now the one true successor to Eddie Brock's Venom. Or at least he thought he was, because after a future version of Dylan shot him with a magic bullet, yep, that's right, you heard it, magic bullet from the future, a bullet that would turn his Venom symbiote into an anti-carnage symbiote, and basically a symbiote that was wreathed in gold, and that after taking out Meridius and the Zombio and turning everything back to normal, it seemed that the Venom symbiote was spent and was dying. It seemed like it was disintegrating, and Venom kicked Dylan Brock out of the suit to spare him that same fate. And then the symbiote leaving his son behind so that he wouldn't have to watch him die and also not be gunned down by authorities, the Venom symbiote disappeared into the night and Dylan, as far as he was concerned, his symbiote father must have died in the process. Well, as it turns out, that's not the case. And technically we knew that would not be the case, but it also explains why this new Venom has gold on his body. Another reason that is, is because Venom's potential host is one of four people. And it's a list of people that it's almost kind of like, man, I don't know how I feel about this list of characters, but it's gonna be a list that ranges from off and on again Spider-Man villains, well, just villain for every Avengers character, Madam Mask, and even Spider-Man ally and confidant, Robbie Robertson, the owner of the Daily Bugle and someone who was probably the only person at the Bugle who regularly had Peter Parker's back back in the day. We also have to take into account former sidekick to the stars, Rick Jones, the guy who has literally been everything from a Hulk to an abomination to a Captain Marvel to a laundry list of other things. This guy's literally probably worn more superhero hats than just about any other hero in the history of ever. That said, we also have, last but not least, the mayor of New York himself, 
and hero for hire, Luke Cage. Now, I remember when they initially made this whole deal out and like, oh, it could be any one of these four people. I was one of the ones who was like, it almost seems kind of obvious that it's either Madame Mask or Luke Cage. Now, the reason why I say that it's probably not Madame Mask, and this is I'm not trying to be sexist here when I say it, but I feel like they would have depicted this Venom or gone out of their way to depict this Venom with boobs. I'm just putting that out there because I mean, she, Venom, had boobs, scream, and a lot of the female host of symbiotes tend to have that. They don't tend to present as, I guess, like a traditionally cis male body. I'm just putting that out there. But because of the fact that we're trying to sell a mystery here, it is likely it could be Madame Mask because there are definitely some proceedings in this comic that are probably going to make you think that that is the case. Just before I get into the spoileriness of it all, I'm going to go ahead and just say right now that of the four people, yeah, I... I still kind of maintain my attitude that I feel like maybe it should be Luke Cage or if it's going to be Madame Mask, let it be Madame Mask. She's come a long way from being a, an Iron Man villain to an Avengers villain to just a, a villain for anyone who ever was on the Avengers uh, and a villain to a lot of other characters as well. But uh, it would be nice to maybe see, I don't know, some kind of a change up there. I will definitely say that just based on speech alone, I'm almost willing to say that despite the fact I feel this way, I think it might be Rick Jones. I don't think it's Robbie Robertson, though there are definitely some things that Robbie says in this issue that might make you think that. Now, I've said all that, but I also can tell you who I think might actually be in that symbiote suit, and it's you. Well, it would be you if you click that subscribe button. Clicking that subscribe button will induct you into the blurred Clintar and give you your very own symbiote suit, as well as tapping that notification bell, ensuring that you gain perfect symbiosis and become a part of the blurred army. Also, while we're at it, make sure you hit that like button because it really helps out in the algorithm, helps me out significantly in the algorithm, and it ensures this video gets in front more viewers like yourself and also ensures that YouTube recommends more videos just like this one straight to your feed. Now that I've said all that, I do want to get kind of more into a little bit more of the spoilery aspect of it. it I'll be honest with you. This book plays with you. This book is going to play with your heartstrings and your mind a little bit because a lot of the characters are presenting as though they could very well potentially be the all new Venom. And whether or not that's the case is another story altogether. I will tell you this right now. If you're thinking that, oh no, Marvel's not going to make it any one of those four people. They're going to pull some kind of a bait and switch. It's probably just gone back to Dylan Brock. No, that's not the case because by the time you get to the end of this issue, we see that Dylan is now staying with Mary Jane and Paul and Apparently, Dylan is getting on Paul's last nerve, so that might actually be a little bit of revenge for a lot of the Paul haters out there. You know, who, who knows? You, maybe. But Dylan is keeping tabs on this whole thing, and he is of the mind that one of those four people has to be Venom. Venom appeared in a courtroom where Madame Mask was being held trial, and Venom didn't show up until all four of these specific characters, Madame Mask, Luke Cage, Robbie Robertson, and Rick Jones were nowhere in sight. It was literally after that. And I'll even take you a step further. One of the things when they were showing off the previews for this, and this is actually where I think the comic gets a little bit tricky and I actually kind of like it. I hate it and like it at the same time, actually. But there's a point where right before Venom shows up, Madame Mask slips out of her cell and Luke Cage in the same page is knocked out of the window of the courtroom to fall down to the concrete below. And it's interesting because almost as soon as that happens, Venom shows right back up. Now, the easy money would be, oh, well, it had to have been Luke Cage. He got knocked out of the window and he's propped back up on the very same window that he got knocked out of. But at the same time, he's also referencing what happened to Madame Mask, almost as if he experienced it himself, or themselves in this case. And then you also think back on the fact that Robbie Robertson and Rick Jones, they escaped to the courtroom together, but split up and told each other to go find help, and neither one of them came back with help. They both showed up empty-handed for the most part, but also the various things that they also say. Rick Jones makes a little smart aleck comment that would maybe make you inclined to believe he might be the next Venom. At a point, they literally talk about what all Rick Jones has been 
in his life, going from being a Hulk to an abomination to a Bucky Barnes wannabe. And then that time he was just a, well, he was actually just a straight up abomination, just a Cronenberg monster of a person in the Immortal Hulk series. And then he makes a smart Alec little remark about who knows who I'll be next. Yeah, just it makes you wonder. But also at the same time, we've also got Robbie Robertson, who's literally talking about how he's not willing to see Madame Mask walk free, not without doing what's in my power to stop it. Almost as if he's saying he could do something more. But the truth is, I think the reality of his statement is maybe more of a red herring because he's probably talking more from like journalistic integrity, using the Daily Bugle to fight back against those uh, the way that the fourth estate is supposed to, not playing patty cakes with power, not playing footsies with power, but holding power accountable. That's literally why journalism is important uh, and, and why good journalism should be something to admire. But that said, that's not what this video is about. You can look at so many different things that have taken place over the course of the past month or so. You could take Venom War into account. The fact that the symbiote, well, it did actually already possess the black and gold colors by the end of the Venom War event. But also, who's known for running around wearing black and gold, or really more gold than anything else? And that's Luke Cage. Madam Mask has been wearing a gold mask for I don't know how long. Almost, I won't say since you know, her first debut, if I remember correctly, she was just a normal, regular person. At first, the mask didn't really come to like maybe just a teensy weensy tiny bit of issues later. But you know, once again, that, that was so many Iron Man issues ago. But yeah, well, the point is that Luke Cage almost seems like the two Two obvious choice is basically what I'm getting down to here. And by the time, and I just want to point this out, by the time that Venom wipes the floor with the AIM battle bots is basically what they are. <laughs> what they actually refer to as battle suits designed only for combat of a play on the acronym of MODOK, which it doesn't really work out well. It's not something you can actually say that makes any damn sense unless you want to go with BS doof I, I don't I, I got nothing there but the point is and there's a guy literally sitting on trial who has seen every iteration of venom he actually calls out that he has seen everyone from eddie brock to matt gargan to flash thompson to lee price i think it's funny he didn't bring up angelo who cares about angelo can we can, can, can we be real the symbiote didn't even care about angelo okay the symbiote did not care and honestly who's checking for lee price either but yeah you know, that's another it's another story altogether. But point is, is that this cat does not recognize any of this Venom's moves. He says that there's some things that are very reminiscent of the other Venoms, but ultimately that's probably just because it's the same symbiote. So in that, it makes things even more interesting. But yeah, Venom has more and new tricks up his sleeve. The ability to create symbiote airbags that can absorb energy so that the symbiote itself doesn't have to risk its integrity to do so, and it's pretty damn effective. It also seems to have even stronger webbing, something that's noted in this issue that Venom's webbing has always been stronger than Spider-Man going all the way back to, uh, was it Amazing Spider-Man number 300? However, this, webbing seems to be even stronger than it has ever been before so there's also that to uh, take into consideration as well this suit also seems to be even stronger than previous versions of venom suits that might also have something to do with the anti-carnage effect that may still be lingering in it something that is likely where a lot of that gold once again comes from but the thing is once the all new venom hightails it out of dodge and gets away after some quips and some one-liners which is kind of one of the reasons why i think it might actually be rick jones rick jones is way more likely to quip than any of the other three characters i feel like i don't know it would be too obvious if any of these characters acted like the symbiote you know like in these shots where we see venom if any of them were like saying sweet christmas or speaking in luke cage isms we would already be calling that the fix is in and the way this guy is talking is not any way that Robbie would normally be speaking. So there's that. I would also say Madame Mask isn't necessarily one to quip as much either. So yeah, I don't know, it just, th there's a lot of things is basically what I'm trying to say. There's a, lot, there's a lot of things that happen here that could literally make me point the finger at Rick Jones. And I don't know, I, I almost kind of want to live in the headcanon that I already had for myself when we were talking about this in the Blur Cave is that Al Ewing loves writing black characters. <laughs> 
I'm gonna say oh. it. I'm gonna say it. Fuck it. Yeah, no. Carter ain't lying. This Al Ewing just want to write a nigga again. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> he just want to write a nigga again. And you know what? I don't blame him. He been white. Look, that motherfucker been writing that dry ass chicken for the last two, three years. And he said, man, finally, I can get him. He said, ooh, he said, please let me write a brother again. Can I please, please, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? Who do I got to kill? You want me to kill Meridius? You want me to kill Dylan? I, I kill That's him. I kill the little motherfucker if you want me to. <laughs> ooh, I kill him. I kill him. That man said, look, he said, just tell me what I got to do. He's like, look, man, I I just, I, just I can't keep, is. I can't keep going like this. Y'all got to be right too many Green white Lantern folks. Absolute wasn't enough, dick it out. You're right. He, right. Needs he, more. Said, he, he said, he said, I need all the nigga books. I need them. It's probably his either first or second favorite thing to do. He inserts black characters into pretty much every book he has ever written. Matter of fact, one of my first books I ever read of Al Ewing's was his Mighty Avengers run, where he pretty much gave us a almost entirely, and then later at a point, an actual entirely all black Avengers team. And then we also had, what was it, Captain America and the Mighty Avengers that followed after that, that was pretty much just even more of that, of an Avengers team that literally had Blue Marvel, Monica Rambo, Luke Cage, Blade, albeit Blade at the time was wearing a Spider-Man costume and, and hiding in plain sight. But yeah, like a Falcon and so many other characters, so many characters were part of this run. And we also had uh, you know, some brown representation in White Tiger. So yeah, it just, I just, I put that out there to say, Al Ewing's type of guy that if he has a choice, if he can write a black character, he's gonna write a black character. I feel like this comic is his way of being like, look, man, that Venom run, whew, it was mighty white. He's like, it's mighty white. Look, I gotta get some color up in here. Please, can I have Marvel? Can I have Luke Cage? Can I have another black character? Well, we can't really spare anything more than a, a Luke Cage. I mean, we can't have too many darkies showing up in the books. Okay, I tell you what, I tell you what. Okay, maybe not a superhero. Can I just take this? Can I take Robbie Robertson? Y'all ain't doing anything with Robbie. Can I do something with him? Well, I mean, he's not a super. Nah, it's okay. It's okay. It's fine. I'll take Robbie. I feel like that was how this all broke down. But all of that aside, yeah, I don't know. I, I keep waxing and waning on who I am uh, inclined to believe it is. But as much as I would love for it to be Luke Cage, as much as I know a lot of people would love for it to be Luke Cage, I don't know. There's just a lot of proof in the lettering of this that it might be Rick Jones.